Well, it's the end of the semester, and it's just really hectic. So, um, and I can tell I'm among many friends. So, thank you for supporting um, this lecture. It's the first time I'm giving this lecture, so uh, pardon me if I slip up sometimes. Um, I just wanted to thank a few people. I really want to thank Dr. Henneberry for giving me this experience in the Division of International Education and Outreach. I just I'm so grateful to have been able to go to Chile earlier this year. Um, I want to thank the West Watkins Center for International Training and Development. You know, Tony is our director here um, for letting me go for a couple weeks and supporting my efforts there. And uh, boy, Congressman Watkins will hopefully be here a little bit later. And most importantly, I want to thank my parents for coming here. They're in the back row. They drove here from about two hours away. And, um, I'm just so grateful to them, and they taught me from a young age to appreciate other cultures and, and be curious about other people. So I really appreciate that. And I'm just so grateful to uh, the university in Chile that hosted me and how accommodating they were. So I'm going to be talking about them uh, quite a bit today. So um, again, thank you for being here. Please. So um, just a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. I will talk about why, uh, why we're here today, why we're talking about Chile, um, and also the history of the relationship between OSU and the University in Chile. Also, um, some OSU student and professor opportunities in Chile, and also my visit, and some brief observations um, about Chile. So just before we get started, I wanted to tell you what my connection to Chile is. Um, I was a high school exchange student there um, in 1996. So just a couple of pictures, the classic exchange student picture on the right um, with my region's exchange students from six countries. And then this was uh, with my class, my classmates, and kind of wearing the uniform every day with the tie and belt and everything. So just a really precious experience. Um, when I was there, I actually uh, lived with the family. I didn't speak Spanish. Yet, and I uh, lived with a family that only spoke Spanish and uh, went to school all in Spanish. So that's how I learned and learned how to adapt to another culture and just exist in a completely different environment. So this opportunity to go to Chile was just, uh, for work, was a dream come true. So really amazing. Um, and then also about the location of Chile, you know, most of you already probably know this, but it's in South America, it's that really long, skinny country. And then where I was, I wish I had a pointer, but it was about uh, two hours west of Santiago, which is in the central part of Chile. And the neat thing about uh, Chile is it's such a long country that it has just about every geography you can imagine. It has deserts, mountains, lakes, glaciers. Uh, it even has Easter Island as part of Chile. And it also has a little, they say, they claim a sliver of um, uh, Antarctica. So it's kind of cool when you see the weather, you see the weather of Antarctica too. Um, so about P, I'm going to re reference the university as PUCB. It's actually the Pontific Catholic University of Valparaiso, um, also known as La Católica in Chile, but uh, I'll call it PUCB. So just a little bit of history. Uh, it was founded in 1924 um, by uh, a woman who actually was married to an Englishman. So um, there were some kind of international roots there from the beginning. Um, and what's interesting is it's similar to OSU um, in its value of outreach. Um, and it actually has, let me see here, nine schools and 35 academic programs. And it has 16 campuses across the fifth region, which is where, um, where this university is located. And um, I was able to visit two of those campuses. And something else that's neat about PUCD is that um, it's similar in the outreach mission, like we have with our land grant mission of uh, outreach, or I should say, research, extension, and instruction. Uh, PUCD, their um, values are um, excellent professional and academic education, solid human values, and strong commitment to public service. So there are a lot of parallels between PUCD and OSU. So it, it makes for a really complementary pairing. Um, and then also as far as their academic <coughs> programs, they offer um, undergrad, grad, and graduate programs in various subjects, um, including, let's see, business, economics, agriculture science, oceanography, art, architecture, natural sciences, law, theology, education, and humanity, humanities, and engineering. So I thought it was interesting, their undergraduate engineering 
program is actually five years long. So you can imagine once you leave that program, you pretty much have a master's degree, but anyway, it's pretty comprehensive. So um, also something else interesting I, I saw that was kind of parallel to OSU is that they have this Office of Technological Transfer, and that was created to disseminate research findings to the public and private sector. So I know we have that. We value that here at OSU. So just some history about the OSU and a PUCB relationship. It's been developing over the past couple of years. Um, you may remember uh, Pia Guyman was the uh, OSU, or the Air National Studies undergraduate advisor. Um, her uncle was actually a professor at PUCB, and he was a visiting professor here in 2011. Then we had a student group go with Pia to PUCB, and also she hosted President Hargis and Ann Hargis there too. So it's good to have support from the top. Um, and then also two OSU students did long-term study programs there, and um, I think one actually stayed there to live. So anyway, it's easy to follow them with Chile, I think. Um, so just to kind of go into some opportunities for students and professors at PCB, um, there's short-term, there's long-term, tailor-made um, internships. Something I thought that was really neat when I was there uh, visiting with the International Relations uh, Office is that they can tailor make a program for you. So let's say you want to learn Spanish and you do, say, a four-week, six-week Spanish class, then you can go ahead and do an internship with a local business. So that knocks out two big you know, uh, areas of study that you want to do while you're in college. So um, I think there are just some great opportunities. And also another benefit is that through the School of International Studies, you can actually enroll in OSU credits. And that's both undergrad and grad. So I can't promote it enough, which is such a great opportunity. Um, and then you see here, just based on my experience and what I observed while I was there is that uh, PUCB and Chile in general have run really top-notch um, study abroad programs. They'll find you a family to stay with. They'll make sure you have transportation. They just they'll really care for you while you're there. Um, you won't ever wonder uh, what you're supposed to do. They're very careful about that. Um, I even had the experience I was helping out a um, MIAP. Are you all familiar with that program? The graduate program in international agriculture. Um, they are required to have an international experience. And it doesn't necessarily have to be academic. It just has to be international. And so PUCB was actually willing to work out a homestay for the student, even though she wasn't going to be enrolling in academic credit. And they were going to line her up with um, teaching English. And so it's they're very accommodating. So, let's see. so I just wanted to um, show you a couple of views of the campus. Um, it's a it's a historic campus. Uh, it's like I said, it was I believe built in 1924. Um, and it was neat when I went there. They showed me a presentation of these palm trees here. When they first planted them, this presentation, they were just maybe, you know, six inches high or something, so they've grown quite a bit. Um, so, another couple of views. Um, when I was there in January, um, it was right before their summer break. So there weren't that, yeah, as you know, as you guys like this towards summertime, there weren't that many uh, students around. But that was kind of a little a common area. And then I put the cafe, there's the Good Day Cafe. I don't know if you went there, Ryan, but I imagine they have lots of Australian students. Um, and then I also put this sign back at the bottom. Um, and the rough translation says, um, the science of learning from others is to accept different ways of thinking. So I thought that was pretty insightful. So um, just a couple more campus views. Um, I put this up here because from just about everywhere on campus, from the second floor and above, you can see the mountains in the background. And something that's neat about uh, La Catolica and this campus in Paparizo is that it's a very urban area. It's, there's a lot of hustle bustle, and it's just a very busy area. But you can still kind of escape a little bit and look out the window and see the mountains. So it's just a really neat <coughs> place. Okay, let's see. So, um, these are a couple pictures of the international relations staff that I visited with. Um, they were very accommodating. Um, when this this trip kind of came together last minute, so um, when I got there, they only had about two and a half days of events scheduled for me, even though I was going to be there for uh, 14 days. <laughs> so um, they were so accommodating, and we ended up working together to get the, the rest of my time scheduled with different activities as time went on. 
So um, just to kind of let you know, the uh, Camila right here, she was my guide the whole time. So just really watch out for me. And this is Marcos Aviles, who's the Director of International Relations at PUCV. And then myself, and then um, we have uh, Monica, who's actually a graduate of Puebla in Mexico. So it's kind of a small world that we have that, con that connection there right in their office. So she's very attached to OSU. I believe she worked at the internet or the study abroad office for a while. So that's some great connections there. Let's see. Also um, at PUCD, the cool thing is they have an office for a German study abroad there too. The DAD, I don't know if you've heard of that, D-A-A-D. Um, and then they have a partner office with uh, Ipesim, which is one of our partner universities. So, great connections there. Um, so while I was there, my second day, I actually took a tour of the rural campus, which is in Kyoto, about an hour away from the city, more inland. And so uh, in, in Kyoto, they have the School of Agronomy there. And so uh, the first place I visited was an agriculture experiment farm. And just kind of looking around, do we have any ag majors or people with ag background here? Just with Dr. Henry. Yeah. Um, and Janet, um, I was kind of hoping we had some ag students here too because um, there are just so many opportunities for ag students in Chile. Um, but that's okay, I think you'll enjoy this either way. Um, so at the agriculture experiment farm, of course, you know, surrounded by the Andes Mountains, um, they test, uh, they do experiments on agriculture or ag agrochemicals and fertilizers. And so what's really neat is that the um, agronomy students uh, throughout like their last year of undergrad and also grad students, they'll manage a certain type of chemical on their crops. And so this is kind of their capstone course to test the impact of fertilizer on crops. So um, it, it was a whole new experience for me. I don't really have much of an ag background. So I, I found it quite fascinating. Um, and then actually I'll show you something I get a kick out of here in a sec. Um, these are just a couple um, other couple other views of campus. It's just it's so different than the urban campus. It's very relaxed. And actually my guide, um, Camila, had told me that she could always tell a student that came from Kyoto that was going to uh, the urban campus because she said they were just so relaxed. I mean, well, it's kind of, I don't know, comparing I guess Oklahoma to New York City, who knows, but um, it was just, it's a beautiful campus. And then, um, so what they did was they gave me a tour of the, agri or of the, of the farm, and um, they kept these really meticulous records, and it was all by hand. So they had these just big old books of, of quantities and, and data that they took of the farms. And then, so anyone that actually goes into the fields has to go through this disinfection chamber, and wash their shoes and everything. And so um, I, I kind of didn't come as prepared as I thought. I, I, as I kind of, they didn't tell me I needed some rugged shoes. <laughs> so they were kind of unhappy with my shoes. So you can see I had these little cute sandals on. And um, anyway, <laughs> that, was, that was a recurring issue, but that's OK. Um, so but it was just fascinating. And then the next thing, actually, I should point out, the gentleman here in the white shirt is actually the director of the School of Agronomy. And I was very fortunate because the rest of the tours that we did in Kyoto happened to be with former students of his. So um, if we go to the next slide, it's actually an agribusiness meeting with a company called Propad. And it turned out that their export sales manager is a, a former student of his. So um, I was able to gain access to this uh, factory that's normally not open to the general public. And so um, basically what we did was that we met with the export sales manager and the plant production manager, Propal. And Propal is actually uh, Chile's largest exporter of avocados. And then they also, basically they represent smallholder farmers all across the region. So these are farmers that maybe not, they don't have much education or resources, but they actually kind of, Propal acts as the go-between. And they go around gathering all these fruits and vegetables they sort them, they clean them, they have quality assurance, package them, and then they sell them for these smallholder farmers. So it's just really fascinating. And for me, um, my, in my job, I advise companies on the process of exporting. So visiting this factory and questioning this um, sale, export sales manager just really it brought to life all kinds of things that I deal with at work. So um, I thought it was fascinating. Now, the only thing is they didn't let us take um, anything into the plant. 
So um, this is the only picture I was allowed to take afterward, and we got to wear the cool lab coats and everything. And again, they weren't happy about my shoes, but um, but I did grab some pictures off the internet. So this is what it looked like on the inside. It was just I had never been to anything like that before. Maybe like Krispy Kreme donuts. <laughs> it's like the closest thing I've ever seen something like that. But it was just fascinating. Um, let's see. Okay. So also after that, uh, we went to visit a company called Copeval, which is um, Chile's uh, largest <coughs> distributor of just everything related to agriculture, equipment, uh, seeds, fertilizer. It's kind of, I was thinking it was kind of like a combination of Caterpillar and uh, Monsanto and Atwoods. I mean, it was just huge. So again, this gentleman on the left is a former student of uh, Dr. Oya Nedel. So uh, I was very fortunate to have a private meeting with him. And again, the um, experience I've gained on the job here at the West Walking Center, it really helped me be able to speak speak his language of um, business development. And um, something that's neat about Copeval is, again, they work with smallholder farmers. So these farmers may not have that formal business education or resources to you know, manage their farms as best as they could. So a lot of times, Copeval will you know, give them advice on better business planning and the value of, in, of uh, investing in better equipment. So um, anyway, it's just really enlightening. So, okay. So my next uh, business <coughs> visit was with a company called Audiolenco. And um, they've been around since the 1970s. And the reason why I put this picture up here is uh, this is the administrative assistant up front. And just it, immediately, I could tell she was like the Kathy <laughs> of a business. I mean, you all know Kathy of front desk. And um, she, this was like the heartbeat of that place. You know, she was holding it together. And she knew my name before I even got there. And so, yeah, she was really, really neat. Um, so anyway, Audiolinko, um, they've been around since the 1970s. And they started out uh, repairing uh, home domestic appliances, you know, microwaves, TVs, toaster ovens. and. They had a pretty good business going. They had um, three office locations in Santiago, Valparaiso, and Viña del Mar. But then around the 2000s, there was suddenly an influx of cheap products from China and uh, Korea, and so their business dropped severely. They ended up having to close their Santiago and uh, Valparaiso offices. And uh, coincidentally, it was, it was kind of the same time the HD TV started coming down to Chile. So they got into the um, HDTV repair business. And they've actually done very well. Now they're the primary warranty repair service center for Samsung, LG, and Panasonic. And so um, that's good because Sam San, uh, Samsung dominates the market in Chile, um, like cell phones, TVs, any kind of recording device is Samsung. So. Anyway, they've done really well, and they've won some regional awards. You can kind of see one of their technicians repairing a flat screen TV. And they still have the um, domestic appliances. They're just kind of, I think they stay in storage a little bit longer. So, um, And I was fortunate to visit this company. I've been following them for 17 years because it just happens to be that the owner is my Chilean host dad. So um, it was really neat to go there and be able to, to interview them officially. So that's my Chilean host dad, and then these are my two brothers. Um, the one on the far right is actually the general manager, and then the one in the middle is a lead technician. So I have to spend the day interviewing them, and um, they were just great. So, okay. So I kind of just wanted to take a little break and um, show you some fun pictures of Valparaiso. This is the city where um, the university is. It's a port city, and it actually used to be the largest port in Chile. Um, it's or it's not as busy as it was before because it just it's not big enough. It can't keep up with the demand for imports in Chile, especially uh, cars, large equipment. So um, anyway, now it's more for kind of small cruises and you know private boating. So I put this picture here. You can't really see it, but there are several um, Canadian flag vessels. And one of them says, I love Jennifer. So I thought that was kind of funny. Um, but as you can see, it's just a beautiful, beautiful view. Always mountains or Pacific Ocean in the background. 
And then these are some major historic sites. Um, the statue on the left is a monument to Arturo Prat, which uh, Ryan may have seen that before. Um, he's a national hero. He actually uh, died in battle on a ship when, with, with the war with Peru. Um, so he, it, it was a really dramatic, heroic thing. Um, and then on the right is the Naval School, which is just a very, it's a big kind of building in Valparaiso. And then um, these are two other sites that you'll definitely see if you ever go to Valparaiso. The, uh, the copper, this is all copper, this monument. And it's, it's been there forever. I, I, I wish I knew the year, but it's been there for quite a while. Um, and then on the right um, is actually the Statue of Justice. And uh, when I <coughs> toured the city with a tour guide, she, she was a native of Valparaiso, and she could tell you two or three different versions of every historic site. And there's a really good story behind this, and I wish I could explain it correctly, but I do know that it's a, it was a spoil of war. It came from uh, Peru. And there's something about her with her arm like this and the sword and the other arm that kind of puts a twist on her being the justice statue. So, anyway, it's interesting. And then when you go there, I know Dr. Denbaugh is familiar with these. These are the um, ascensores, which are these little carts that go up and down the mountains. And um, I, I don't know about you, I'm from Florida originally, and Oklahoma's pretty flat. I wasn't familiar with these, these devices. You might have them in California, but, um, but basically you use these to get up and down these really steep uh, mountains and hills that are in Chile. Um, and something that's really neat is that they, they don't operate on electricity. It's all completely operate on pulleys and um, cables. So, interesting. But also, um, with these ascensores, you know, you can see how, how steep it is. So, if you're afraid of heights, you might not know what to go on. Um, but I remember when I lived there in the 90s, some of these ascensores, they were just really rickety. <laughs> so, you can see the walls kind of expanding, and you know, you see the gaps, and, um, anyway, but you just trust that it works, so. <laughs> right in the um, so a couple more just really pretty views of Um It's just it's just kind of a it's a very historic city. It's actually uh, how do you say it? Uh, one of the UN's cultural heritage sites. So um, just since it got that designation, I believe in I think it was two thousand eight or two thousand six. It's there's been a lot invested in attracting tourism to Valparaiso, so it's a very beautiful city. Um, and then I couldn't help taking this picture. I don't know if you can tell, but that's an orange house. So I thought I had to get that for OSU. So, um, but I was very fortunate when I went there. It was pretty much springtime. Everything was in bloom and just you know lots of blue sky everywhere. Um, and then this one, one more last scene. Um, this is kind of a joke. I'm not, you know, some of you, maybe Jess is familiar with what this thing is. It's very it's like a it's, yeah, it's very European. It's a bidet. And um, so someone got creative with that. Um, you used to see these in the houses a lot in Chile. I know when I lived there, we had a bidet, and I didn't know what it was. <laughs> so, and I didn't speak Spanish, so, and it was kind of awkward because it was in the bathroom, and so I didn't know how to ask what it was, and it, it just, it took a long time to figure out what that bidet is for, so. But basically, it's a bathroom thing. Um, so anyway, someone got creative and uh, planted plants in it, so I thought that was neat. Um, and then just another beautiful view from Valparaiso. Okay, so back to business. Um, while I was uh, there, uh, I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to do some research, both at the at one of the, I believe, 18 libraries that PUCD has. So I was at one of the main libraries. Um, I was very fortunate to be um, hosted by the director of the library, who gave me full access to their databases, and he even let me use his printer and copier, which is a big deal, because um, I'm not sure how many of you traveled in Latin America, at least my experience in the southern home countries is that it can be very challenging to make a photocopy and to print something out. So that was a big deal for him to do that for me. Um, but also, I had access to these Spanish language databases um, that I wouldn't have access to here, and um, theses and dissertations that are pub only published and housed in those libraries. So um, I was just very fortunate to have full access to that. Um, and something that I thought was really neat, uh, let me go forward here. Um, this is the library director and the head librarian that just kind of took me under the wing. 
um, I thought technology is so cool because I had my iPhone there, and so what I would do was look up the reference at PUCD, and if there was one that was at another library I had to go to, I would just you know take a screenshot with my phone and then go to the other library and be able to bring that up. So it's just something that I didn't have back in the 90s, you know. Um, but if I go back, let's see here. These pictures are actually of the House of Congress library, which was just very modern and um, uh, just fascinating. Um, so that, that's what I would do. I would look up references at PUCD and then go to the House of Congress. And uh, they had a very modern library. Uh, uh, the only thing you still had to do was put in paper requests. Uh, you, you can't actually go look up things yourself. You have to put a request in. So anyway, I, I hope to follow up on uh, some more on that research. So it was a great honor to be there. And so uh, after I went to the, the House of Congress library, that led to an opportunity to do a tour of the House of Congress, um, which is kind of, kind of different from us because the Congress of Chile it isn't in the capital city of Santiago. It's actually in Valparaíso. So, um, so they were really separate. The White House is, you know, two hours away, and, and here's Congress. Um, so when I spent the day at the House of Congress, um, I had just a wonderful tour guide. Um, you can tell this building is just it's massive. It's just huge, and that's only that's the short part. There's a, a building right behind it that's even taller. So um, it was just really neat. Um, and then you'll see right here, uh, I happen to be there um, during some special ceremony. So um, in this scene, or that picture, you can kind of see the man in the middle is actually the president of the Senate, which is the second in command in the government. So, and you know, there was, I didn't have to go through hardly any security or anything, but um, I was just very fortunate. And then this on, on the left is actually, it's the national seal of Chile. And what's interesting is that this is car, it's a marble stone relief carved, but it's actually um, attached in like a squares because the area is so earthquake prone, um, they, the artists made it that way so that it wouldn't be as vulnerable when earthquakes happen. So I thought that was interesting. And then right here actually is, a, is there a, a replica of the Declaration of Independence of Chile, um, actually signed by um, their national hero, their founding father is uh, Bernardo O'Higgins. So, um, but the reason why it's a replica is because the original was in their, basically their White House, which is called uh, La Moneda in uh, Santiago. But on um, September 11th, 1973, you, some of you may know there was a coup in Chile and their White House basically got bombed. And unfortunately their Declaration of Independence was destroyed. And at that time there just weren't that many pictures of it. So, um, there was an artist that took it upon himself to recreate this Declaration of Independence, but it just took years of research and um, dedication, but he finally was able to make that recreation. So now it sits at the House of Congress. So. And um, afterward, I took just a little walk around. It's just a very impressive building. Um, some of their gardens uh, around here, they actually have trees that represent all the different regions. There's 15 regions. And then they also have plants and trees donated from other countries or gifted from other countries. <coughs> um, and then that on the far right is the symbol of the House of Congress. It's that three C's, Casa Congreso, Chile. Uh, anyway, I had to kind of be like uh, discreet when I was walking around because there were security police officers and eventually they walked up to me and told me, you know, you can't go any further. So I was like, yeah, I got those pictures when I did. Um, Okay, so uh, something else I did while I was there, I was just so um, pleased to be able to do this, but I went to visit a regional office of Pro Chile, which is the, basically the Export Assistance Agency of Chile. And um, what's really neat is that they do a lot of what, what I do in our office at the International Trade Center. They help small businesses in Chile with the um, process of exporting. So uh, I found it fascinating, again, we, we spoke the same language, um, so that was just a great opportunity. And just to kind of put it in perspective, Chile is so business friendly. Um, you can see, you can kind of compare, the U.S. has 21 trade agreements with 58, I'm sorry, the, the, Chile has uh, 21 trade agreements with 58 countries, whereas the U.S. has 15 trade agreements with 20 countries. And the earliest trade agreement, from what I understand, that Chile signed was in 1993. 
So they've been doing this for a while, and you can see uh, they're just very open to international business. Um, and then something else I found very interesting uh, were some uh, initiatives by the Chilean government. Uh, Circo Tech is kind of similar to small business development centers like we have in the U.S. Um, also, Amcham Chile is the American Chamber in Chile, and they um, their goal is to promote business between the U.S. and Chile. So um, a lot of great resources there. And I thought my favorite thing actually was Startup Chile. And this was started in 2010. And it's actually um, a program from the government of Chile to attract international entrepreneurs. So they'll provide funding, like equity-free seed capital, a temporary one-year visa, and access to um, social and capital networks in Chile for international entrepreneurs to start their business in Chile. So it's, it's a huge investment. Um, that's great. So if you want to start a business in Chile, actually, it'll help you. Once you establish a business, you can actually get residency in Chile. So I thought that was interesting. So I rounded up my trip with a visit to uh, the Embassy of Santiago. Um, again, they didn't allow cameras, unfortunately. Um, so I had to take pictures outside. It's kind of hard to see, but that's the seal of the U.S. Embassy. And then this was just outside. It says Embassy of the United States of America outside. Um, it was it was lovely. Um, I should say I also met up with a uh, OSU alum there. Uh, some of you maybe came to the lecture last fall with Brian Manning. He's a Foreign Service officer, and then I also met with Dr. Ed Johnson, who is a uh, he's the technical director of the U.S. Army International Trade Center of the Americas. So um, I was just very fortunate to have the opportunity to see them. Um, and then something, just my little side comment about the embassy. Uh, when I lived in Chile for six months, the first U.S. flag I, I saw that whole time was the day before I left. And that was, you know, flying at the U.S. embassy. So I always wanted to see what it was like inside there. So, um, so just a few kind of final observations. Uh, the country of Chile is changing so much, especially for me, having lived there in the 90s and gone back several times between then and now. Um, it's really in a boom period right now. You can see this huge skyscraper. That's just one of many going up. Um, Star Starbucks, I don't know if you can see it very well, but they have 29 locations in Santiago alone. Um, it was really cool because I, I actually went there and I was able to bring a Wi-Fi on my iPhone and it was just, they're just so international. Um, so that's significant, I think. And then also sushi. Uh, that just was non-existent when I lived there before. It's very popular now. Um, and then the other one has IKEA, which is, I think, indicative of the growing middle class. So um, just, you know, lots of changes happening there. And then something else I noticed, I don't have any pictures about this, but uh, there's definitely, there's more uh, ethnic diversity there. Before when I lived there, it was just all Chileans. The only non-natives I, I met were um, U.S. Navy guys at one point, you know, but otherwise it was all Chileans when I was there. But now you see people from Cuba, Venezuela, Colombia, even some, you know, Argentinos, Brazilians, um, relocating there because of the economic crisis. Uh, there's just not as many jobs in their home countries, so they come to Chile to find work. So. I find that Chile is facing similar problems to us and that they have this big influx of immigration. So I'm interested to see how they handle that. And then another observation I had was kind of backtracking to Ikea and sushi and Starbucks is that um, you see there's a consumer culture there that just didn't exist before. Before when that there was just you had what you needed and you were satisfied with that. So now um, there is a lot of use of credit cards, whereas you know in the 90s there just were no credit cards; it was all cash. So I'm interested to see how that affects, you know, their economy, um, especially the, the debt levels. Do they even know how to handle debt? Is there any education in this public education or private education? So, um, and I'm sure there are other countries that are going through this over the past 10, 15 years. So, um, anyway, me personally, that would be a area of study I'd like to look into. Um, and then some uh, final remarks. Uh, Chile is a great place to study abroad, um, to conduct business and to visit. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity now for, for those of you that are in school still. Um, you know, learn Spanish, do an internship, 
Um, and then also, I wanted to give credit one last time to my exchange family in Chile. Um, they hosted a going away party for me. Oh, it's some more um, And also, my mom last night now. Um, so anyway, I do have some materials here. I think I went much faster than I expected, so that's good. Um, but I have some materials here about PUCD. Um, I also have some uh, fancy chocolate from Chile, if you would like. Um, and it does have nuts, though, just to let you know, I've also over here. And then something else I found at the House of Congress Library that you just don't see every day was for these uh, documents translated into the four native language, languages. So the language from Easter Island, um, Aymara, Mapuche, and Quechua. So anyway, if you want to just check it out, it's really neat. And then I have a couple of brochures about the Chile agency if you'd like to browse through those. So um, anyway, that's my presentation for now. Any questions? Or... That's an interesting question because when I lived there, there were just 13 regions. There were actually, it's kind of like we have the 50 states in Washington, D.C. When I lived there, it was, uh, it was 12 regions plus Santiago was the 13th. But now they have actually 15 regions. These numbers, right, instead mm -hmm. of a name for the region. Yeah, so uh, the area of Valparaiso and Viña del Mar is called Quinta Región, which is the fifth region. So. Um, when did they replace the base to use names for some of the regions uh -huh. traditionally? If you don't know, that's okay. I'm not sure. I'm going to be surprised. I mean, there's definitely there are names for different areas. Like people from Valparaiso, they'll call them um, Porteños because it's on the port. Right. So I, my my exchange brother actually we used to play a game where we he'd say I'd say a city and he'd tell me the name of the people from that city. You know. So and the thing about I guess kind of um, a little off topic, but about Chileans, the thing that I found is that they're very witty and so funny and just. Um, the, their Spanish is a bit different than other countries, I think partially because they're isolated by the mountains. Um, but they're just very, um, they're very conversational and always have a story to tell. And, you know, my other exchange brother, he only speaks in slang. So, you know, I just love listening to him because it's just off the charts. So, I don't know if that answered your yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> it's just kind of unique because usually you don't find a lot of countries that give regions just numbers. Yeah, um, sometimes they call it, um, like they'll say Vaparaiso, but they're including all these different cities. Kind of like Oklahoma City had Edmond and Edward Moore, so. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Any unique culture or something? Sure. Um, I mean, yes, it is a very, it's a unique culture. Something I really like about Chile is that they, they're very, um, conscious of relationships with your family and your friends. And some parts of Chile still observe the siesta, where every all the store, or most of the stores close down from about like 12 to about three or so. And you go home, you have lunch with your family, um, you take a nap, and it's just great. And then, but then the stores open up again, and then they stay open fairly late, 10, 30, 11. So you'll find that really, when, when you go to work there, you might go in at 9, but you don't really start working until about 10, 10, 30. And, you know, it's just um, very relaxed. I, that, something that fascinates me, though, is now with their very strong economy, um, they have the best of both worlds. Because I'm going to say, even though they have a consumer culture and they're busier with, you know, more things to buy, they still, um, they still, I don't know, they still honor those relationships with their family and friends. They have something called onces, which is, uh, tea time in the afternoon. It's around 7.30, I guess it's evening, but um, it's all relative. <laughs> so, but you just, you can either go home or you meet up with friends and you have some tea or coffee and you have a biscuit or something. And, uh, it's just great, it's great. Um, they also are very, they're very proud, very nationalist, which you find that a lot in Latin America. So um, there's this dance you may have seen on the flyer, it's called the Cueca and it's their national dance, and kids actually learn that from kindergarten, and they'll practice it all the way up until about sophomore year of high school. And um, the idea is it's a male, it's kind of like a, um, looks like a, they're dressed like cowboys, you know, from, from the country, and a beautiful flowing dress with a female, 
and they, they both have these little um, uh, handkerchiefs. And the idea is it's based on chicken and hen chasing each other. So they, they do this kind of like circling around each other, and, and they do this, you know, waving their handkerchief, and the man has spurs on, and at the end he'll, you know, stomp his spurs, and it's just, you know, I think that's very, very typical culturally. And then, um, well, anyway, I could go on and on, but I'd say probably the, the cherry on top of the cake is the food. Um, they, they eat seasonally, and they just, they have a lot of good comfort food, so. Um, we are, we are, I was fortunate when I lived there, and I still work with this woman, but we had a, a maid that did all the cooking and cleaning, and she was a great cook, so. Anyway, um, I, something else I had in my notes, but I'm not sure if I mentioned it. If anyone here is interested in studying in Chile, especially on a long-term basis, um, Dr. Denswall with International Studies is very supportive of this, and you know we'll work hard for you to get some funding to help you out. Um, but please, you know, let me or Dr. Denswall know if you're interested in studying. Any other questions? Um, again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Henneberry, again, and Congressman Watkins, the West Watkins Center. I, I know I mentioned you earlier before you came in, but I'm just so grateful to have had this opportunity, and it was uh, a dream come true for me. So, thank you.